All right, everyone. Um, good evening. Thank you all so much for coming. My name is Mehlaka Samdani. I am the Director of Critical Connections, an organization based in Massachusetts that builds community awareness and empowerment around issues related to American Muslims and other targeted communities. Our event today is going to focus on recent developments in Palestine and Israel. In the weeks leading up to the most recent wave of violence, there were Palestinians in occupied East Jerusalem who were facing imminent threats of forced displacement from their homes. There were protests happening at the same time in support of those who were being forcibly removed. And on the night of May 10th, as supporters and worshipers were praying at Al-Aqsa Mosque during the holiest nights of Ramadan, Israeli security officials um, attacked them. At that point, Hamas intervened militarily with rockets directed at Israel. And soon after, the Israeli military began its assault on Gaza. In the violence that ensued, 248 Palestinians were killed, including 66 children, and 12 Israeli civilians, including two children, were also killed. Um, there was a ceasefire that was finally imposed last week, and while the cessation of hostilities did bring some relief to Palestinian and Israeli civilians, it did not and will not end the structural violence that is visited upon Palestinians on a daily basis by the Israeli occupation, by forced displacement and discriminatory practices and laws. All of this is very clearly documented by both Palestinian and Israeli citizens, Israeli human rights groups, and most recently by Human Rights Watch in its report called a threshold crossed, Israeli authorities and the crime of apartheid. So what will it take to end the structural disparities that currently exist? What did recent uh, events and developments, what impact did they have on the Palestinian national movement for liberation? And how can American citizens support their quest for freedom? To answer these questions and more, we are very honored to be joined by Dr. Ramzi Baroud, um, who is our distinguished guest today, and we will introduce him shortly. Now, before I turn to my friend, my longtime friend and co-moderator for this evening, Aline Batarse, I do want to say that our event today is going to center and prioritize Palestinian human rights. This is not a both sides event. And this is not a both sides issue, given the massive power differential and asymmetry between the Israeli state and the Palestinian people. However, after we have asked uh, Dr. Baroud a series of questions, we will open up the discussion to our audience. It's a very diverse audience, and we welcome all viewpoints, all perspectives um, uh, that people want to share. You don't have to necessarily agree with our speaker or our viewpoint, but we would welcome all perspectives um, in the question and answer session. What we will not, however, countenance or even tolerate is any kind of bigotry that is directed against Palestinians, that is directed against the Jewish community or any other racial, religious or ethnic group. So with that, um, I'm going to now turn uh, to my very good friend, Aline Batarse, um, and introduce her. Aline is a Palestinian from Jerusalem. She is a development professional and community organizer and has worked with international and Palestinian nonprofits aimed at advancing human rights, women's rights, and mental well-being. Aline is a board member of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network. Alina, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Mahlika, for this introduction. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here tonight and to be moderating this very important conversation with Dr. Baroud. Uh, I hope you don't all have uh, Zoom fatigue. So uh, Mahlika and I, as she said, are very long friends, uh, longtime friends, and um, it is such a treat that I got to talk to her every day this week uh, to plan for this conversation. Um, so without further ado, I want to introduce Dr. Ramzi Baroud, uh, who is a 
a US Palestinian journalist, media consultant, and author, internationally syndicated columnist, editor of Palestine Chronicle from 1999 until the present, former managing editor of London-based Middle East Eye, and former deputy manager, managing editor of Al Jazeera Online. Dr. Baru taught mass communications at Australia's Curtin University of Technology, Malaysia campus. He is the author of five books and a contributor to many others. His latest volume is The, the Last Earth, a Palestinian story. Baroud has a PhD in Palest Palestine studies from the University of Exeter and is currently a non-resident sen senior research fellow at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs, Istanbul Zion University. He is also a non-resident re uh, senior research fellow at the Afro Middle East Center in Johannesburg, South Africa. So Dr. Baroud, I want to turn uh, to you now. Um, my first question is around now, you know, what's happening right now. Uh, it would be great if you could begin by updating us on conditions on the ground since the ceasefire was announced last week. Right. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank you uh, and Mahlaka for um, uh, the opportunity to speak to your audience and to the excellent work that Critical Connections um, are doing and have been doing for some time now. Um, and also to the people who are tuning in to listen to us today. Um, I think it's very important that when we speak at the, the situation now on the ground is that we kind of liberate ourselves from certain illusions that this ceasefire is an end to anything. Uh, maybe it is an end to a specific uh, event, <clears throat> the event that Mehlaka has introduced earlier, uh, but it hasn't really answered any question and hasn't resolved um, uh, any uh, particular thorny subject that led to the uh, war in Gaza in the first place. Um, I think we need to call things the way they are. This is not a conflict. It is an Israeli military occupation of Palestine. Uh, it's not a dispute. It is an Israeli, an ongoing Israeli apartheid that is recognized to be uh, an apartheid, not just by Palestinians and their supporters and advocates, but also by Israel's own organization, largest human rights group, Beit Salem, as of January uh, uh, earlier this year. And Beit Salem was trying to be very, very specific regarding the nature and the use of the term apartheid. They say this is not an apartheid that only applies to the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, but it's an apartheid from the river to the sea. Uh, i.e. in the entirety of historic Palestine, including the occupied territories and today's Israel. This by no means is going to end the ethnic cleansing of, uh, that has been uh, underway in East Jerusalem for a long time, not just starting in, uh, uh, in April in Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in East Jerusalem. This is but a microcosm of a much deeper, larger, and convoluted issue that goes back many years. Um, I say this because <clears throat> there is a great deal of relief uh, now that is happening uh, regarding the ceasefire. It is good to see that innocent civilians are not being mutilated and being killed with so much impunity. It is good that we see people's homes, businesses, schools, mosques, churches not being destroyed. It's good, but uh, it's not good in the sense that Palestine is now a free place and the apartheid has ended or dismantled, the occupation is over, the Gaza siege is over. None of these things have been achieved. This is the proper context. In fact, Israel wanted to make a very clear point, send a message to the Palestinians who are celebrating in the West Bank and Gaza, and we can talk about why they are celebrating. They're not celebrating the ultimate victory against the Israeli occupation. They are celebrating a very specific event an event in which the popular resistance in Palestine, throughout Palestine, has managed to impose itself uh, as a component, as a, as a political actor in this so-called conflict that has been determined uh, largely by Israel and Israel alone. Uh, this is what the celebrations are all about. 
Uh, this uh, now, of course, uh, the Israeli propaganda and its supporters are pushing this notion. Well, I mean, Gazans, after all, are the ones, at least in this particular episode, who fired rockets at Israel first. Now, this is really quite a, a deceptive claim. Uh, deceptive in the sense that Gaza, prior to all of this, was not a free place in which people kind of willy-nilly choose to fire rockets at Israel. Gaza is under a hermetic Israeli siege, has been under this siege for 15 years. Gazans are not allowed to leave or to come back. They are lacking every basic necessity of life. Israel controls every aspect of their lives, including um, cancer patients who cannot or not allowed to reach hospitals in the West Bank to receive life-saving medications because of the Israeli siege. Um, and of course, another important element here is the uh, killing uh, in Gaza or the Israeli killings in Gaza never really stopped. Um, even during the time in which Palestinians stopped retaliating by throwing ro rockets against Israel, there was a period, I think started sometimes in 2018, lasted for about a year or so, where Palestinians have decided to try a different form of resistance, uh, what we call the Great March of Return. That's when tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands at various points of Gazans, decided to go to the fence, separating besieged Gaza from Israel and protest peacefully. No weapons, no arms, no bombs, no rockets. The outcome was over 300 Palestinian were killed, mostly children and teenagers, and thousands, over 10,000 wounded. A couple of thousands of them have lost the ability to walk or to use their hands because of the specific type of bullets and the specific type of injuries inflicted on them by Israeli snipers. So when Palestinians threw rockets at Israel, this time around, it was within this context, but of course, the way we understand the situation in Palestine is quite selective, especially because of the way that mainstream media uh, portray the events in Palestine. So it make it, they make it appear and sound as if Israel is actually the beleaguered party that is being on the defensive, that Palestinians are the aggressors, as if people who are under military occupation are not allowed to fight back. They have no right to defend themselves as Israel only and exclusively applies this right to itself, as Palestinians do not have the right to be free and to be liberated from military occupation, from racism, and from apartheid. Will they do? And they made that very, very clear in recent weeks, and we have nothing to apologize for. Any nation that is living under the, um, uh, the, the regime of racism and apartheid and colonialism and military occupation anywhere in the world, throughout the 20th century and even before and until today, anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere, from South Africa to uh, India, to Algeria, anywhere else in the world, they have the right. In fact, they have the moral duty to fight back and to achieve their coveted freedom. The mainstream media doesn't want you to know any of this. They insist that Israel is a victim and Palestinians are the aggressors. The international community disagrees the United Nations disagrees, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International and even Israeli rights groups uh, disagree, but Israel wants you to believe otherwise. Um, thank you for that, Dr. Baroud. And you've already sort of described the debilitating conditions that Gazans lived in even before this most recent wave of violence. Uh, but sort of coming to what just happened um, over the past two weeks, um, the UN estimates that um, more than 91,000 Palestinians in Gaza have been rendered either homeless or displaced because of the Israeli airstrikes. Um, 1,800 housing units and 33 media institutions were also destroyed. Um, and the UN estimates that it will take Gaza years, if not decades, to rebuild. How do you see the future um, in the near term and also the long term of the 2 million Gazans um, who are currently living in the Gaza Strip? Um, in two words, uh, bleak yet hopeful. The short term uh, future of Gaza is going to be quite bleak. Um, we know that because of previous experiences. Sadly, uh, this latest attack on Gaza is not unprecedented. 
we have experienced that and we have reported on that and we have been talking about this for 15 years. 2008, nine, Israel attacked Gaza with a similar ferocity and they have killed over 1,300 Palestinians there and they destroyed much of the infrastructure of the Gaza Strip without allowing Palestinians to build, without allowing cement into Gaza, without allowing the international community and solidarity coming from all over the world to, to enter Gaza. They repeated that action again in 2012 and again in 2014, particularly the 2014 was the most destructive as over 2,400 Palestinians were killed, over 500 of them were children and over 20,000 Palestinian homes uh, and various types of uh, structures were destroyed. Now, it's important to also place this within context, the context of the fact that Palestinians are not allowed to rebuild these uh, infrastructures. Unfortunately, the last time I was allowed to visit, visit my family in Gaza was in 2012. But even then, I was able to see the Palestinian ingenuity uh, and, and the Gaza's resourcefulness at work. Because cement is not allowed to enter, many of the buildings were the concrete uh, that, that were turned into dust and concrete. The concrete was reprocessed once more. And some of the houses that were destroyed were actually rebuilt from the same concrete that was destroyed in the first place. But of course, this is not enough to deal with the need of 2 million people who have been living under Israeli siege for this long. And, and it's not enough to deal with new needs that cannot, no matter how, uh, uh, how clever, how resourceful uh, a nation is, there are certain things that they cannot on their own rectify. For example, the lack of medications, especially life-saving medications for thalassemia, for cancer patients, and so forth. So even, even diarrhea has become a, 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 a deadly disease in Gaza because of the lack of medications, but because of the pollution of the water. According to the World Bank, 97% of Gaza's water is polluted. Even hospitals, like the Shifa Hospital in Gaza, does not have, most of the time, does not have to access to clean water. And the other reason of why Gaza does not have clean water, because Gaza runs on a single generator that Israel, or a single electric grid that Israel keeps bombing over and over again. Uh, so Gaza lives, even prior to this recent war, has been living with three to four, uh, and at, you know, best case, best case scenario, five hours of electricity per day. You're supposed to sustain an ailing, already destroyed economy with five hours of electricity per day and manage all these hospitals that have to cater not only to the previous needs of the last wars, but also to the new needs resulting from the COVID pandemic. Even testing kits, it was a great struggle to allow Israel or to push Israel to allow for a few thousand testing kits into Gaza. As a result, uh, the, the besieged Gaza became a thriving environment for COVID-19. Uh, this is just an, 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 additional, uh, uh, um, uh, an additional problem that was added to Gaza's many existing problems, resulting in a great catastrophe, a catastrophe that the United Nations has dubbed uh, or dubbed Gaza as a result of a few years ago to be, the, uh, um, to be uninhabitable uh, by 2020. Now we are past 2020, and if Gaza was uninhabitable before the recent war, you, will, you, can, you can do the math and imagine what Gaza is like right now. But Gazans are still hopeful, Palestinians are still hopeful. And the reason behind their hope is this. No matter what Israel is able to do, in order for them to inflict harm to the Palestinians, especially the civilians, because they are trying to create pressure on the Palestinian leadership, they're trying to create pressure on the, the, the resistance in Gaza. So in order for them to relent and to accept whatever uh, uh, conditions of surrender that Israel has for them. Um, so no matter what they do, the resistance continue. And when I say resistance, I'm not talking about rockets. Rockets is, is, is a form of resistance that is one of numerous other facets of resistance that exist in every inch of Palestine, in every Palestinian community. That resistance is really at its all times high at this point. The spirit of the resistance is re-emerging 
from Ramallah to Nablus, to Al-Quds, to Al-Khalil Hebron, to Umm Al-Fahim, to Gaza itself, and so forth. There is a, a renewed sense of unity, renewed sense of national priorities, renewed sense of nation that is now challenging the borders and the geographies and the settlements and the checkpoints and the bypass roads and, and, and the apartheid system where the Palestinians, especially this young generation of Palestinians, are once again able to reconstruct their identity as one people like never before. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Bernoud. And that's a great um, segue to the next question. Um, so the Palestinian activists called for a general strike last week and hundreds of thousands of uh, Palestinians participated in it. What does this joint action by Palestinians, despite the physical fragmentation imposed by Israel, mean for the future of, of the Palestinian movement for liberation, including the future of Palestinians with Israeli citizenship? Right. So for years, I have been arguing, and I know others have as well, that Palestinians are already united. All of this talk at, about talks about Palestinian disunity is really failing to tell the true story of Palestinian unity. Disunity among factions do not reflect on the Palestinian people. Um, any resistance movement, any liberation movement, anywhere in the world, uh, take for example, the, uh, the Algerian example, or, or the Cuban example, or the, the Chinese example, any movement, any country that went through any process of liberation and anti-colonial action had all sorts of fragmentation that's happening among its uh, uh, groups, uh, ideological gap camps, uh, and so forth and so on. South Africa was an extreme example of this, actually. We don't talk about it because the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa succeeded. And naturally, when people succeed, they talk about the positive uh, in their movements. They, they try to marginalize and forget that kind of dismal history in which not only they disagreed, but violence was quite extreme among the groups that expre expressed that kind of disagreement. Palestine is not the exception. But when I say that Palestinians are united, what really matters to me is that the unity of the narrative, the unity of the actual discourse. Do Palestinians in, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, in Palestine 48 today's Israel, or in diaspora, still feel a, a, a Arab war that, that unified them as a nation? Are they united in their expectations and their desire for freedom, for justice, for unity? These things have always been there. And it's always expressed in various forms of popular resistance and popular movements and, and can be seen through art, through culture, through theater, through songs, music, every, in, in every other way. But they are also confined. They are geographically confined. Gazans are living under siege. Uh, the West Bank is divided, uh, not just under Israeli occupation, but it's divided within that occupation to various strata of area A, area B, area C. Each area, each region, each group, each village has to acquire an Israeli permit to go from one place to the other, to cross an Israeli checkpoint to cross the Israeli wall, uh, to cross to Jerusalem, or for the people of Jerusalem to cross to the West Bank. Now, use this as, as a microcosm to everything else. Palestinians like myself, I am not able to go back to see my family. My family is not able to leave to see me, and so forth. So we rarely have uh, platforms in which we can display that unity. So when, when I discuss that Palestinian unity does exist, sometimes you would have to, um, you have to go to great extents to actually express that Palestinians are in fact united, but you can't really demonstrate it in practical events. What happened in, in this month, and especially the historic general strike that reminded us of the first Intifada of 1987, when the Palestinian people, regardless of religion, ethnicity, uh, geography, even class, have all rose in tandem throughout all of Palestine, not only unified uh, in their anger at what Israel is doing and the extreme kind of violence being used in all parts of, of Palestine, but also unified in their slogans of, what, of who they are and what they want. 
this whole notion of the Israeli Arab, the so-called Israeli Arab, that has already been assimilated. And you know, no matter how bad the situation for them is in terms of racism within Israel itself, they still find themselves lucky not to be Palestinians under occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. That illusion itself was dismantled. As, it, as the Palestinians of 48 living inside Israel right now were in fact not only part of the movement, this popular movement in Palestine, but were actually taking leadership of that movement. So this is why I think we are at the cusp of a historic movement here. This is not about Mahmoud Abbas anymore. It's not about, about the Palestinian Authority anymore. It's not about Hamas and Fatah anymore. It's about the start of a new generation, or rather a generation that is ready to take over and to define itself and to express itself uh, the same way that my generation uh, had its movement in 1987. When the Intifada of 1987 started, I was 15 years old and we were lost and we were confused and, and we felt betrayed and, and the Intifada allowed us to articulate who we are as a people and uh, articulate our, our values as a generation. Um, I always argue that intifadas, uprisings do not liberate people, but they liberate discourses. Now the Palestinian discourse is being liberated. I do not want to exaggerate and say, we have figured it all out. I think it will be a lot of hard work, a lot of management on the ground at a grassroots level throughout Palestine and even outside of Palestine of us finally entering that conversation of who are we as, as a people and what do we want and, and how do we overcome Oslo and the ills of Oslo and the culture of Oslo and the classes that were created in Palestine as a result of Oslo and where do we go from here? I am optimistic that we are definitely on the right direction and we are definitely having the right conversation. Sure. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that the future would allow us to advance that conversation until we truly have an alternative to the current leadership we have in Ramallah. Uh, thank you so much for that, Dr. Baroud. And that's exactly my next question. I mean, you know, it's about the next um, uh, sort of generation of leaders who are now emerging. A lot of the general strikes, a lot of the protests that were being organized were not being led by either Fatah or Hamas. It, these were young leaders who were, you know, um, organizing and sort of forming networks across the different territories. Um, so, but my question is, how would uh, these new leaders emerge? in terms of, I mean, what would be the vehicle for that emergence, considering that elections were recently canceled? And how are they now organizing? And what are their sort of, uh, uh, what are they focusing on in terms of their own organizing around how they can make their voices heard um, to perhaps replace Fatah and Hamas, um, who have far less credibility? Right. I, I'm glad, Malaka, that you mentioned the elections because that, that election was supposed to be quite critical. Now, um, we know that no real democracy can exist under military occupation. But what we were hoping that that elections would achieve is that it would allow the, the Palestinians, at least within the West Bank and Gaza, as a starting point to articulate a new political discourse to allow for a new leadership to merge. We're not saying that this leadership should uh, ultimately represent all Palestinians everywhere and answer all the, the unanswered questions. That was never really the, the, the aim from it. But at least we were hoping that we, we could use this as an opportunity to move past Mahmoud Abbas and the corrupt Palestinian Authority. The, the challenge this time wasn't Hamas versus Fatah. That was quite relevant in the past. Now, not so relevant anymore. The, the, the challenge was Fatah versus Fatah. Fatah is the ruling uh, group within the Palestinian Authority. It's the group that dominates the PLO. It's the group that dominates the Palestine National Council, which is basically the Palestinian parliament in exile. Uh, and they have also, but not all of them, but a particular clique within Fatah had dominated the Palestinian political discourse and the Palestinian decision-making as well. 
But the problem with that is, is this. Uh, that group was ruling with absolutely no claim to any democratic process whatsoever. Even Mahmoud Abbas, his mandate, which was really quite limited to begin with, expired in 2009. For 12 years, he has ruled, he's 85 years old now, he has ruled with no democratic mandates, and he is making major decisions concerning Palestine and the Palestinian people. Now, he was being challenged by, by, by uh, people within his own party, but a different generation, led by Marwan Barghouti and, and by others within the Fatah party. And in fact, it was that particular branch within Fatah that according to every major opinion poll regarding the elections that was made in recent months, it was the Marwan Barghouti group that was actually supposed to take over Fatah. And taking over Fatah would have been a, a very important uh, a prerequisite to fixing a lot of the problems that exist within Fatah, within the Palestinian Authority, within the PLO, within the Palestinian leadership, and also the factional problems that are happening between Hamas and Fatah. Mahmoud Abbas knew exactly what was going to happen and under Israeli and American pressure, and I would say other Arab countries as well, he has decided to stop the elections. So the decree he released last January, it was the very decree that he violated later on. And he said, well, we can't really go into new elections because Israel is preventing the Palestinians of Jerusalem from, from participating. And of course, it's a laughable notion. I mean, he's trying to manipulate a uh, certain truth, but using them for his own personal uh, uh, and, and political interests. Israel was never going to allow Palestinians in Jerusalem to vote in the elections. Israel is an occupying power, and they have made that very clear. That Jerusalem, um, of course, contrary to international law, is the undivided and unified capital of the Jewish people, and therefore Palestinians will have no form of political expression whatsoever, now or forever. We knew that, and Abbas knew that very well. And even Palestinians in Jerusalem also knew that very well. So to hinge the decision of allowing Palestinians throughout the occupied territories to vote because of this poor claim that the Israelis were not going to allow them, even though we knew that in advance, it was a clear pretense. Mahmoud Abbas was playing a political game. He wanted to escape that responsibility of going through an election that changes the very face of the Fatah movement using Israel as the excuse. And another proof of why this was indeed a pretense and he was never truly genuine about his demand of Jer people in Jerusalem voting in the elections is, why didn't we hear much from Mahmoud Abbas while Gaza came to the rescue of Palestinians in Jerusalem and the West Bankers all rose in unison with Jerusalem and even Palestinians of the 48 Israeli citizens, Arabs, rose to, in solidarity with Jerusalem and yet, Mahmoud Abbas disappeared. He wasn't taking any leadership in defense of the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood uh, to stop the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians in Jerusalem, the extreme violence that was being used against them by the, by the, the, the illegal Jewish settlers and the extremists in Sheikh Jarrah and elsewhere. If he truly cared about Jerusalem, he would have formulated a contingency plan and would have led that plan and he would harness all the energies of the Palestinian resistance everywhere in Palestine to come and fight for his cause. But of course, it was a pretense. He disappeared. He went in hiding. While all of this was transpiring in Palestine, we heard very, very little from Mahmoud Abbas. And now we are back to that point. We know that Mahmoud Abbas and the few millionaires that made so much money as a result of this Oslo industry money coming from the so-called donors countries who are trying to sustain a status quo as opposed to actually solving a problem, we are now back at that starting point. What do we do with Mahmoud Abbas? That's the question that Palestinians are asking. They are unifying in terms of discourse and narrative, but they feel stuck at the Mahmoud Abbas component because Mahmoud Abbas is protected by the Israeli army and by the security coordinations between the PA and Israel. So in other words, he's an asset for Israel. And that is a question that Palestinians have to confront sooner or later. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Baroud. Really rich answer. Um, 
and reflect so many of the frustrations that we have as a people, right? Uh, that our leadership has completely failed us. Um, so Palestinian activist Fadi Quran recently said, our struggle is no longer about one state, two state, or three state solution. It is about building Palestinian power and striving for our freedom. What does that look like on the ground in terms of organizing efforts, given that our leadership has failed? Absolutely. I think, I think we have to make a clear distinction between solutions and visions. And I think one of the biggest problems when we discuss the one state solution has been mixing between what is a solution and what's a vision. In my view, a solution is a political answer. Um, but but if, if the one state solution in particular is a political answer, you would have to have the political will to make it happen. Or the same thing applies to the two state solution, which I really don't want to take uh, even a minute to discuss it to begin with, since it's always been a defunct solution. And it's really no party has ever been sincere in making it happen to begin with. It was the carrot that was dangled in the face of the Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian people, enticing them. That if you behave yourself, if you shun violence, if you behave in a certain way, if you crack down in, on your extremists, uh, if you do exact things exactly the way we want you to do them, then you could potentially at one point in the very distant future with absolutely no further elaboration on this subject, maybe one day you will get your own state. But, but the weird thing about all of this is number one, Israel is not, never interested in a two-state solution. They never agreed truly from, and I'm talking from, from in terms of political machination here, never tr truly agreed to a two-state solution. Not just that, they never agreed to, for Jerusalem to even be included in any negotiations regarding that potential solution until Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli right-wing prime minister, decided we are beyond that. We are talking about annexations now. We are talking about settlement expansions. We are talking about ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem and elsewhere. What two, two state solutions? But the other reason of why, and, and I promise to talk less than one minute, but I'm talking more than a minute about the two state solution, is that if the United States, the self-designated honest peace broker, were ever interested in that two state solution, then how do we explain the contradictory type of behavior? On one hand, you insist on a two state solution, yet on the other, you do everything in your power to make sure that that two state solution is never actualized. You insist on a two state solution, yet on the other hand, you continue to fund the very illegal Jewish settlements that are being built on Palestinian land that's supposedly to be allocated towards that two-state solution. You insist on a two-state solution, then you recognize Jerusalem to be part of Israel's capital forever and ever. And you would say, but wait a minute, that was Donald Trump who has done so. It's not the Biden administration. Well, the Biden administration has not reversed that decision. So it's a done deal. It's American foreign policy regarding Jerusalem. So how is it that we are capable of talking about two-state solutions and we are doing everything in our power, not only not to enforce or to push or pressure Israel to respect the two-state solution formula, but we are actually funding Israel with billions of dollars, through $3.8 billion a year to do everything in its power to prevent that two-state solution from actually ever taking place. Then let's talk about the one-state solution. I don't think it's a solution. A solution means that you have two parties that are disputing something. And then maybe they are sincere in their dispute. Maybe they really feel strongly about their viewpoint. And then Ramsey comes from Seattle or Chicago or London and he says, hey guys, guess what? I have a solution that should work. We live together side by side, we coexist. No differences between an Arab or a Jew, a Muslim or a Christian, we're all equal, we're all the same, we're gonna share this land and share the resources. And that's the moment when Benjamin Netanyahu stops, pauses and says, Ramzi, absolutely brilliant, you just figured it out. It doesn't work that way. 
we never expected that Israel is just truly and sincerely looking for solutions to be offered to them by anybody. They know exactly what they have done wrong and they know exactly what they need to do in order for them to sustain this current power paradigm that is skewed against the Palestinians and in favor of Israel. So it's not a solution that we want, it's a vision. Now, if you talk about a solution, if we want to be blunt about it, well, um, a solution to apartheid is ending, ending apartheid. A solution to military occupation is rolling back your military occupation. A solution to the illegal Jewish settlements in the West Bank is to dismantle the Jewish settlements in the West Bank. A solution to the Gaza siege, how about this novel idea, end the siege on Gaza. That's a solution, but of course, that is really never in the cards to begin with. It's not solution that Israel is looking for. Israel feels that it's making a lot of money from these settlements. Even the, 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 the weapons that the, and, and the missiles they are lobbing against Gaza, they become a major source of marketing for the Israeli uh, weapons industry, which I think is like number six or seven largest military industry in the world. And, but Israel ha ha has an advantage over their competitors in the arms market. And that is they promote their weapons to be field proven or, or, or uh, uh, field proven or, or, or combatant proven, meaning that they have, we have used this. We have used this and we know it works. Well, they have been using against Gaza and civilians. So even the siege on Gaza, even the war on Gaza is a source of profit for Israel. So we don't really need solutions to any of this. We need to confront Israel. We need to push back Israel. We need to hold Israel accountable to the kind of crimes that is com committed in the West Bank and Gaza, not solutions that we want. We want to see real and serious and sustainable pressure on Israel. In other words, BDS, boycott, di divestment, and sanctions. We need the international community and civil society to take its moral, legal, and political responsibility and hold Israel accountable the same way that apartheid South Africa was held accountable at one point in the past until they relented and dismantled apartheid. This is what we want. As far as Palestinians are concerned, we're not very concerned with solutions because we know that Israel is not waiting for Palestinian ingenuity and genius to come up with solutions. What we are working towards is we need to make sure that we are unified as a people and we are resisting as a people and we are developing our strategies in such a way that does not serve the interest of a particular individual, political party or a faction, but the interests of the Palestinian people, all of them at home and in diaspora. This is the true power that the Palestinian people possess. And we have seen it in action. I think this generation might have not uh, uh, seen this particular infusion of Palestinian powers as we have seen in the last two, three weeks. We need to see more of this in order for Palestinians to play the role that they should historically, historically be playing in this, in, the, in this situation. And that is to unify their forces as a nation in order for them to push back with the hope that the international community would, could, may wake up at one point in the future and stand in solidarity with them. And uh, Dr. Baruz, we will talk about that, how the international community, how American citizens can support those efforts, those local Palestinian efforts and Palestinian efforts in the diaspora as well. Um, but I just did want to sort of, uh, uh, you know, sort of when you talked about holding Israel accountable for its human rights violations and the occupation, um, you know, just recently um, there were Israeli um, groups um, who partnered with Palestinians and um, they had demonstrations, they had, you know, they were calling for the end of the Israeli occupation and these were Israeli groups who were doing that standing together and break the silence and so that kind of internal pressure for that kind of um, movement away from, you know, the current practices that the Israeli government is engaged in, how would you respond to that and does that give you any semblance of, you know, optimism? Right. Practically, no. But morally, yes. Practically, in the sense that Israel, the, the left in Israel, and when I say left, I'm really forced to do air quotes, because Israel's ideological groupings and manifestations are different than many other parts of the world. 
the Israeli left, especially the center, is not really center at all. I mean, if you if you listen to the political messages coming from Benny Gantz, for example, in the center, they are not fundamentally different than that of right-wing Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In fact, in many ways, they are even more right and more militant than he is. For, for years, Netanyahu has been shamed by the center for not doing enough to protect the southern communities of Israel, not doing enough to destroy the, the terror infrastructure of Gaza, and so forth and so on. So I wouldn't take these kind of ideological designations of the various political camps in Israel too serious. But that said, there are indeed small groupings within Israel that have historically stood on the side. And, and not just that, even though they are absolute minority, they are becoming more and more aware of the situation to the point that the way that they frame they frame their political consciousness regarding what's happening in Palestine is becoming actually closer uh, to the way that we Palestinians view it. I'll give you an example. And I wrote an article about this uh, about a month or so ago. The language that B'Tselem, the Israeli rights group have used to describe Israeli apartheid. For, for many years since it was established, B'Tselem has been quite courageous in the way it criticized uh, Israeli military practices uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. But they are also have been very, very careful not to use language that may appear too aggressive, too leftist, if you will, too radical. So the language has always been kind of somewhere where we Palestinians say, well, it's an Israeli group. It's close enough. But we're not really, truly happy with it because we know that they are being too selective in the areas they are studying, in the terminologies they are using, they are trying to hold the, the stick from the middle. But if you look at their January report, that the language is as, it's as strong as it comes. I mean, finally, I feel like we can actually say that there are Israeli groups that, that from an intellectual point of view and from a political point of view are actually more or less on our side. We are really in the same category. And we would even use the same language and we would utilize the same political discourse to describe what the Israelis are doing in Palestine and what the Israeli government is doing in terms of apartheid and so forth and so on. So I think that's where if there is a source of hope, it would be very, very cautious hope. Um, but we have to also be realistic that the number of Israelis who consider themselves uh, uh, on, on, on the left or or radical or, or speaking openly against the Israeli government practices is really shrinking in, in, in ways that are unprecedented since the establishment of Israel on the ruins of Palestine in 1948. And the right camp, the right wing that, that has uh, historically kind of like had its chances to hold power is now defined. Not only the right is defining mainstream politics in Israel, but those who were on the fringes of the right, and here I am talking about uh, settler groups, I'm talking about uh, ultra-nationalist Zionist group, I'm talking about orthodox groups, they are now becoming even the very heart and the very center of the, the, what Israelis considered right-wing politics. So, so I, from an ideological point of view, Israel has moved a great deal to the right and the left has shrunk in ways unprecedented to the point that Haaretz, and, and I think the New York Times reported on this about this migration kind of, uh, of thousands of Israelis are leaving Israel, coming to the US, to Europe and other parts of the world because of escaping the kind of political repres repression that is not only felt by Palestinians, that's a fact, but also by Israelis themselves. Um, I want to turn to the U.S. Uh, now, and, and you touched upon some of this before. Uh, do you agree that there has been a shift in public opinion in the U.S. and on the narrative around Israel and Palestine? And what has changed or what needs to, to change in your opinion? Right. Uh, yes, definitely. There is change. And that change has been happening for quite some time. And I've um, I've spent a lot of time in, 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 in the last few years kind of studying the shift, 
that's happening within the Democratic uh, Party as well. This was uh, like, uh, now you kind of see titles in newspapers uh, of, of for, the, for, for the first time, majority of Democrats are anti-Israel, meaning anti-Israel occupation and so forth. This is unprecedented. No one would, could have really guessed at any point in the past that the Democratic Party would at one point become hostile to Israel, but there are reasons behind it. And, and right now in particular, there's a lot of research just emerging regarding this particular issue. I just read an article that, is, is, uh, uh, that talks about how this, uh, uh, the woke mo uh, uh, movement in the United States, this youthful movement where they have different political identifications and relationship to politics are, are, are now kind of seeing their relationship with Israel based on different identifiers than those that were put in place by their, by their parents and their grandparents. Uh, even within the Jewish community in the United States, especially among young Jews, they are also, I mean, they are Americans, they are part and parcel of this society, and they interact with their Palestinian colleagues and students and, and, and fellow activists in various civil society organizations. So we are actually beginning to also see a different trend happening within the young Jewish community in the US, but also within the young democratic uh, constituency throughout the United States. And now we are seeing the manifestation of that happening on the very top. Now, um, I also argued in a recent article regarding this very issue that let's not get too excited about the fact that there are some changes happening within the, the top of the pyramid within the Democratic Party. For example, Rashida Tlaib, Ilhan Omar, Cortez, uh, McCallum, uh, Bernie Sanders, and others who are speaking more openly and more courageously regarding what Israel is doing in Palestine. My argument was, it's to the contrary. These people at the top of the pyramid are just an expression of an existing change that has been happening at a structural level within the rank and file of the Democratic Party. To prove my point, according to a recent uh, Pew research uh, um, that I also cited in my article, uh, it says that among Democrats, again, we are talking about general constituency, rank and file Democrats, among, Demo among the Democrats who, have, who are familiar with the BDS, the boycott movement, majority of them support BDS. Now, if you actually compare this position, many of the people who seem to be strong pro-Palestine supporters like Sanders are against the BDS movement. And, and, and uh, in fact, Sanders uh, recently, and that was a good article published by Ali Abu Nama in the Electronic Intifada, talks about how Democrats should tone down the rhetoric regarding Israel. Even Sanders, as beloved as he is among our constituency, he is still, he feels that there is a certain threshold of criticism that cannot be passed. Um, and, and, but that is not the same situation among ordinary Democrats who are waking up to all of that is happening to the power of the pro-Israel lobby in Washington DC. And they actually want to see fundamental change happening. And I think this, this collision between the rank and file between ordinary Democrats especially among the youth and the leadership of the Democratic Party, we are beginning to see that the leadership is beginning to concede. Again, I am being very careful with my wording here, very cautiously, very slowly, sometimes just nuanced language, but indeed something is happening. And I think the future of the Democratic Party, uh, if, it, if this trend continues, the future could indeed bring about is serious and, and if not fundamental change, but at least badly needed and critical change as far as the American political discourse uh, regarding Israel and Palestine. Thank you for that, Dr. Baruth. Um, I'm just going to ask one last question and then we're going to open it up for Q&A and I'm going to encourage people to submit their questions in chat. 
um, you can do it either um, in for everyone to see or you can um, you know text Aline and I privately with your question. Um, I did want to just quote something um, uh, Dr. Baruth you know you mentioned BDS um, and you know POMEPS which is the project on Middle East political science at the University of Maryland they recently did a poll around that um, among Americans and they found that 49% said that they had heard about the movement um, and 47% of those who had heard about it opposed it, and 76% of Republicans within that opposed it. However, a majority of Democrats, 80%, Republicans, 62%, and Independents, 76%, indicated opposition to laws penalizing people who boycott Israel, and principally over the fact that these laws infringe on the constitutional right to free speech and peaceful protest. So there is that shift as well against criminalizing um, BDS. Um, and so uh, the last question, I guess, is, you know, what are um, the opportunities and challenges of this current moment here in the US regarding Palestinian human rights? Um, what areas should pro-Palestinian or social justice activists focus on in their efforts to support Palestinian freedom? Thank you for that. And, and if I may just uh, say something um, before answering this question, just to follow up on the, on the numbers you have given. I think one of the biggest mistakes, and I'm, I'm not posing as an advisor to Israeli, uh, to, to, uh, to Netanyahu, but I think one of his biggest political mistakes uh, he committed is the fact that he uh, moved Israel uh, much closer to the Republican agenda. And by doing so, made Israel, which has for decades uh, kind of persisted somewhere between all political trends in mainstream uh, uh, American politics, uh, which has always been the support for Israel, has always been bipartisan support. He made it a, a, an internal political issue for the United States. And I can go on and on giving examples for that, but one particular example uh, uh, it stands out, and that was even before, years before the Trump administration uh, took over uh, the White House, um, there was a time where Benjamin Netanyahu came to make a case uh, to challenge Obama regarding Iran. And he came and he spoke at the Congress, and many Democrats were absolutely furious with that. And, and Democrats uh, everywhere as well were quite unhappy with how Netanyahu comes and he gives a speech attacking their own democratically elected president uh, within, within the heart of American politics, within Washington, DC, within Congress. And I remember many at the time writing about the power of that pro-Israel lobby that went from being an advocate for Israel, uh, 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 you know, an advocate like any other strong lobby group in Washington, DC, to kind of taking over the center stage and to humiliate the very president of the United States and make him feel like he's a total outcast uh, within his own constituency. And I remember at the time, Joe Biden, he did not, he was trying to find, he was the vice president at the time, was trying to kind of hold the stick in the, from the middle, uh, did not want to oppose Netanyahu because God forbid he was gonna pay a political price for it. So he kind of manufactured this trip to China that was completely unscheduled and it was that, in my opinion, was kind of the height of the hoopries of Netanyahu. He really felt truly empowered. He can do anything. When Trump came to power, he created this alliances, alliance with him, and, and Israeli politi politics became like almost like a, a wish list. Trump and Kushner and Pompeo were meeting all Israeli expectations, checking every box of every Israeli demand. Netanyahu felt truly at the top of the world at that point, but what he did not realize that throughout the years of doing such a thing and, and behaving in such a way, he was indeed losing ordinary Americans. Americans are not as stupid as the media wants us to think, that they are so easily indoctrinated and brainwashed. People were listening and people were watching. And when the opportunity presented itself more and more people start making the right choices regarding this issue. And I think with time, we are gonna see a massive shift. In fact, we can already talk about a massive shift, not a critical mass as of yet, but definitely a massive shift. When you see criticism of Israel 
uh, of Israeli apartheid, genocide, war crimes being used by numerous mainstream celebrities, sportsmen, um, uh, politicians even. That is unprecedented. When I first came to this country about 27 years ago, I used to hear these horror stories about a single individual, a professor, uh, an actor, a sportsman who raised his voice against Israel and somehow this, his career would suffer. Somehow he would lose uh, tenure at a certain university. Uh, these times have changed. Now, because more and more our, our people are speaking out, it's much harder for, for the uh, pro-Israel lobby to isolate them and to punish them and to kind of teach everybody else a lesson through targeting certain individuals because there are numerous people who are speaking out. Now to address your question and quickly so, when I first uh, used to come out, uh, go out and protest in Seattle, um, the, the, num the, the demographics of these protests used to be quite predictable. Uh, number one, the numbers were quite few. Uh, not many people would show up. Uh, usually they are made of few um, Palestinians, Arabs, progressive Jews, and few other white people. And I'm sorry to use this term, I feel uncomfortable using racial uh, classifications, but this is American politics, so we kind of have to be honest about it. Um, and, and, and if we ever had a person of color joining us, then people would start whispering. They would feel like, wow, we are reaching out to new constituency. Listen, there's a black woman who's standing here with us. Um, in the second week of war on Gaza, there was another protest in Seattle. This time it was attended by um, nearly 2,000 people. And it was joined the majority of the people who attended it. The demographics have changed exponentially since then. People of color, minorities, women groups, uh, feminist groups, uh, um, national liberation movements of, of uh, various South American countries and Nepal and this and that, they were all part of it and they were all passionate about it. And the answer to why this is happening, and that is the code that the Palestinian solidarity movement has already tapped into, and they understand that the key here is intersectionality, intersectionality. The days in which each small group demonstrating on their own um, are gone. When Native American people stand for their ca a cause of any cause that concerns the Native American uh, uh, um, uh, people in this country, Palestinians are there. And when the Palestinian protests started in Seattle and across the entire United States, Native American groups were there. Um, apart, we are small, we are fragmented. And sadly, we can also be ineffectual. Together, we are powerful. We actually have a mass movement with a political discourse and we can push and we can fight back and we can make a difference. And I, I think this is really the future of Palestinian solidarity in this country. Mutual so solidarity, communal solidarity, grassroots solidarity and intersectionality. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baru. Thank you so much for that very powerful um, uh, response to that question. We have a lot of questions, uh, a lot sent privately, a lot some in the um, everyone chat. Um, if I could uh, begin with Yecheskel Lando's question. Um, if Marwan Barghouti were elected president of Palestine and Israelis could accept him in that role, what changes in Palestinian policy internally and vis-a-vis -vis Israel would he try to implement? Um, yes, yeah, so that's the question. Well, let's make it clear that Israel will never actually accept him in, in this role. But that's, that's what reality is. The Israelis may accept to talk to certain Palestinian leaders to defy, def, divide Palestinians into radicals and moderates, Palestinians we are willing to talk to and terrorists we, are, we want to shun and so forth. That's an Israeli choice. I can't, and we can't change that. But if Marwan Barghouti is elected by the Palestinian people as a president of Palestine, I think there's a great opportunity here for Palestinians. Because right now it's not state building that we want. You can't build a state when you actually don't have the, 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 the freedom uh, and, and the sovereignty 
over a specific territory in which you can build a state. So this whole, whole illusion for the last, what, quarter of a century, actually a lot more, of us talking about state building and, and, and state institutions and funding the institutions has always been really quite frivolous in the sense that you can't build a state without having total and absolute sovereignty over a piece of land. I think one thing that Marwan Barghouti could introduce is to reframe the struggle. It's no longer about state building, it's about national liberation. It has always been about national liberation. We were just told that we are being rude if we say it's about national liberation. You can't say national liberation within polite company uh, in front of the donor countries with their billions of dollars controlling every aspect of our lives. So we learned to be polite and we learned to change the terminology even though we knew that we are using deceptive, unreal, unrealistic terminologies, we learn to change all of this so that we are presentable and we are amiable and we are moderate from the viewpoint of the US, Israel, and the donor countries. Marwan Barghouti is in prison. He has been in prison for 18 years and he is not going to abide by this kind of terminology. In fact, there is no evidence and I've read uh, uh, several documents prepared or signed by Marwan Barghouti while he is in prison I don't see any evidence that his political discourse in any way overlaps with that of Mahmoud Abbas, Salam Fayyad and others. So he will be taking us really back to where the language that should be used is being used. That's number one. Number two, he is going to unify the Palestinian people around him. Even Hamas supporters like Marwan Barghouti. Marwan Barghouti is in prison and in Palestinian culture, you know, there are two things you can't argue with. You can accuse anybody of treason, of being a compromiser, of, of selling out, but two people, two types of people that you can't, you can't accuse of anything. Someone who died or, or someone who, who had a member of his family being killed by Israel, that's, you know, you can't touch that person because they demonstrated their sacrifice, their ultimate sacrifice, but also a prisoner, especially someone who has been in prison for nearly 20 years. So you are gonna have a point of unity between Fatah and Hamas and between the various factions in Palestine. Another thing, Marwan Barghouti is a follower of Yasser Arafat. Yasser Arafat, despite of all of his mistakes, and I personally spoke about many of these mistakes in the past, despite of all these mistakes, Yasser Arafat managed somehow to keep the social fabric of Palestinian society intact. He knew how to speak to Hamas. He knew how to speak to the socialists. He had a very good friend within Palestinian Christian community and Palestinian Muslim community. That diplomacy of Arafat kind of carried through in Marwan Barghouti's style and political discourse as well. So that is very, very important in my opinion. And one last issue, why Marwan Barghouti would be important. You actually, and I'm thinking here from like a sheer PR uh, point of view, the, the democratically elected Palestinian president is in prison. Um, I don't like comparisons. I don't like when people tell me, where is your Palestinian Gandhi? Where is your Palestinian Mandela? Because I know the intention is actually to belittle our, our activists and our organic engaged leaders and intellectuals and so forth. But in this particular incident or in this particular example, I am willing to make an exception. You are gonna have a situation here very similar to Nelson Mandela, where he was in prison and only his freedom meant the starting of a serious uh, discussion towards a political horizon of inclusion and coexistence within South Africa. We will have a democratically elected prison, uh, president who also is a prisoner in an Israeli prison. And I think from a psychological point of view, uh, it's, it's quite a powerful narrative for Palestinians and their supporters around the world. Thank you so much, Dr. Barut. That, that is very powerful and inspiring. Um, the next question is from Nasima Merchant. I hope I did not butcher your name, Nasima. Uh, what role can US news and social media play to present facts from both sides, not their own opinion, fairly and equally to the American public? Many times it is really hard to see facts about Palestinians from their standpoint, get fair representation on mainstream US media. Absolutely, and I don't think, um, I don't think we're gonna be seeing any change 
I don't think we'll ever see any change. And I'm not being kind of a, a Debbie Downer here, but I am, um, I am, I am just stating the, 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 the truth, the sheer facts. And the facts is mainstream media exists in the service of corporate, uh, 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 for big corporations. I mean, that's how it works. Noam Chomsky has figured it out before uh, me and my generation 40, 50 years ago when he wrote Manufacturing Consent uh, with, with uh, Dr. Herman, the idea that, um, that um, the media does not think and behave uh, and, and express itself independent from many other factors. No, no big company is going to start an, you know, a media outlet and, and, and put hundreds of millions of dollars because they want them to serve the cause of the truth and nothing but the truth. They do it because they want to serve the interests of that corporation, the interests of the powerful few, and the pow powerful few have very intrinsic links and relationships and interests with the government. And the government has a political agenda, and that political agenda is pro Israel. So to wake up one day and realize that the New York Times has shifted its coverage entirely, it, it's just, it's just, it's not going to happen. So if you are relying on mainstream media as a source of truth uh, and facts, uh, please find some other alternative because that's not gonna happen. It's illogical for it to happen. And I actually think that this whole idea, let's put pressure on mainstream media is, is frankly a waste of time in the sense that the media is, and I am someone who has worked in media and I, you know, I've interacted with many people, my colleagues, BBC, CNN, I worked for Al Jazeera and even, you know, outlets like Al Jazeera, there, so, nobody is going to invest a billion dollars in a project to serve a moral cause or a moral purpose or to satisfy his ethics. It doesn't work that way. But it doesn't mean we give up on mainstream media. We have to push back. We have to stage a fight. We can't just give them a, 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 a blank check to do whatever they want. We have to hold them accountable. We have to monitor them and, and watch after, over them and if possible, try to get them to concede ground, however marginal, but we must do so. But I think our greater energy should be invested in alternative media, in alternative sources of information. Um, in, in recent weeks, uh, I've been following um, young bloggers from Gaza. And I'm talking about young bloggers like in their teens and, and early 20s. And, and I was really, I would marvel at the kind of impact that these young people, for example, the group, uh, We Are Not Numbers, I just marvel at the impact that these kids, some of them with all due love and respect for them are writing in, in, in improper English, uh, bad grammar, sometimes outright broken English, but you would see their videos, their tweets, their words being retweeted thousands of times, higher than the average of an, a New York Times article that's being retweeted. This is why social media is cracking down and they are cracking down hard. Because again, once more, civil society, ordinary people, grassroots organizations, activists have tapped into a code that would allow us not only to balance out mainstream media, but to push back as well. So I suggest that our greater efforts and energy should be invested in giving people like these young Gazan bloggers a voice, creating platforms, allowing them to speak for themselves, listening to their version of events and their own history. One, one area of history that I have invested years and years of studies and I've done my PhD on the subject and I wrote several books on the subject is that of people's history, ordinary stories, narratives of ordinary people, the best and most effective way of dehumanizing the Palestinians is listening to the Palestinians and realizing that you have so much in common with them and their stories and their grievances and their aspirations and their hopes and dreams are really maybe based in different political contexts, but ultimately very similar to yours and to everybody else. So this is something that we really need to work hard to to help with and, and, and to allow to flourish is working with the Palestinians in, on the ground and supporting their media. I don't want to even mention my newspaper right now, but support electronicintifada.net, support We Are Not Numbers, support such organizations that do tremendous work and are actually able
to make a large impact and indeed, as I said earlier, push back against the dominance of mainstream media that have dominated this subject for far too many years. And also support Palestine Chronicle that Dr. Ramzi Baruth is the editor for. Um, Dr. Baruth, this would be really helpful also if at some point in the chat, if you could maybe write, if you remember the names of the Gazan bloggers so that people are able to follow them. Um, also, I did want to, I said I had promised you like we have a very diverse audience, so we have all kinds of questions. Um, so this one is from uh, Mark Jakowitz, and he asks, how was Gaza able to create kilometers of tunnels, which Hamas claims Israel only destroyed 5% and over 4,000 rockets that were fired from Gaza? Where is the money coming from and how can these materials get in and not um, essential supplies. Does Hamas represent the Palestinians and their real values? Right, so I don't want to turn into an advocate for Hamas at this point, but I will, I, I am not ashamed to be an advocate of genuine Palestinian resistance. And let me define the word resistance the way I see it. I do not distinguish between uh, popular resistance and armed resistance. I think armed resistance, true armed resistance, is the resistance that has the support of the majority of the people. In the past, many Palestinian groups uh, attempted to create space for armed resistance in Gaza. I lived in Gaza until the mid 1990s. And I know from personal experiences, what I saw, what I observed that there, is that every single attempt has failed because it did not have the strategic depth of having real connection with the Palestinian people. Hamas started from my uh, middle school. Um, one of my friends, his name is Mohammed Dukhan, joined Hamas, uh, joined, uh, uh, started Al Qassam group. Um, I, we were absolutely shocked when we learned that this, the kids from, from the Nusayrat middle school for boys um, actually started a, an armed group. Um, and we were even more shocked when we saw them appearing once. They were all killed like within days after that. They appeared once in the martyr's graveyard uh, with a gun. And we don't know where that gun came from. Some people had theories that it was bought from an Israeli soldier. It was bought uh, stolen from a soldier, uh, whatever the truth was. But it was absolutely shocking. It's like in, in Palestine under occupation in Gaza, you don't see peoples with guns. but. The point I'm trying to, to make here, and I elaborated on this in my book, My Father Was a Freedom Fighter, is that the initial start of the current armed resistance in Gaza literally began with four middle, class, middle school students in central Gaza. Now, when you look at what has happened to that movement, um, it's, it's absolutely astounding. And the question is, if that movement did not have grassroots supports and popular supports among Palestinians, including Christians, by the way. The independent newspaper, the British independent newspaper had a very interesting article two, three days ago uh, that talks about how Christ Palestinian Christians are now becoming growing list in support of Hamas against Mahmoud Abbas. So I think we have to think about this question beyond the propaganda, be beyond just just random classification that this is a terrorist group, these are good Palestinians, these are bad Palestinians. How did this come about? Why is it that Palestinians are able to resist and why are they willing to go to these kind of extreme extents to resist despite the extremely high price that they pay for that resistance? You speak about the tunnels. Let me be more, a bit more specific. The Vietnamese resistance against American imperialism and American invasion of Vietnam in South Vietnam in particular, mounted to 270 kilometers. The tunnels under Gaza are about 500 kilometers. They are mostly dug out by small shovels and by hand by Palestinians in the last 15 years. Why are they tunneling underground? Why are they doing this? I mean, if they were free just to express their, 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 their uh, live their life as normal human being. Uh, they are able to go to their schools and universities and hospitals. If people like me are able, you know, at one point I was so desperate. I asked my family in Gaza, I said, I am willing to come under a tunnel between Gaza, uh, between Egypt and, and, and Gaza to see my father before he was buried. I couldn't. 
My father got ill and was buried. And years and years before that, I did not see him. And, 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 I'm, and you know, until today, I haven't even visited his grave. How is that even possible? If we were allowed the freedom and the luxury to travel the same way that the Israelis are traveling. Palestinians are digging tunnels because they actually have no other option but to dig tunnels. Now, let's be clear about this. Tunnels as a military strategy is not unique to Palestinians. It was utilized uh, in, in World War I, it was utilized in World War II, it was used in Algeria against French colonialism by the Vietnamese. It's, it's a war strategy. And it's a strategy to those who have no other alternative but to create that strategy. How are these rockets made? Well, I am no engineer uh, or military engineer specifically, but um, I know for a fact as, as an investigative journalist that many of these uh, rockets, especially the, 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 the ones with limited capacity are actually made by uh, improvising on water pipes, uh, uh, either very strong thick plastic or metal water pipes. Again, why would people go to that level of desperation to fight in such a way, knowing that the price is the death of their family members, their neighbors, their friends, and ultimately themselves, if they had any other alternatives. We can sit and talk about Hamas and the terrorism of Hamas and what Hamas has done or has not done, or we can be realistic about this and say, if there is no Israeli siege on Gaza, if there is no Israeli occupation of the West Bank, if the Israeli military does not humiliate Palestinians on a daily basis from Al-Quds to the West Bank to, to, to Gaza to everywhere else, if apartheid did not exist, I assure you that Palestinians would have absolutely no business improvising little water pipes to create rockets out of them. The Palestinian people are, despite of everything, despite of all the limitations and despite of their lack of resources, are one of the most educated Middle Eastern nations. And in fact, our women, Palestinian women uh, in Palestine have the, the graduation uh, or the, the, those who hold university degrees are 19%. It's the highest in the entire Middle East. We are a nation of people who want to live a life of dignity. I assure you that. We have absolutely no illusions about this. But on the other hand, I also tell you, and I tell you very assuredly, that Palestinians are very stubborn people. And there can never, ever be a situation in which we accept humiliation as our status quo ante. That we accept occupation, apartheid, racism, and the fact that we are an inferior race with an inferior language, living under the, the, the jackboots of Israeli soldiers, where our mothers and fathers being ethnically cleansed from their neighborhoods in Jerusalem, where our mosques are constant attacks by illegal extremists uh, from Israel and from the West Bank. We, there can never be a situation in which we will coexist with this dismal reality. So we will fight. Some of us fight like me by writing and speaking to you. Other people fight uh, by organizing and mobilizing in the West Bank. Other kids fight with rock, ro rocks and, and, and slingshots and others improvise uh, water pipes in Gaza. It's all part and parcel of the same anger and the same frustration and the same determination to finally achieve our freedom. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Baroud. Um, and and just I just wanted to add to that. I feel you know the fact that you cannot even vi visit Gaza, that my residency status is really I mean it's not permanent, right? It's <laughs> it's revocable, and that. Israel, uh, that Jewish Americans, for example, who have no ties to the country can go and travel and live in our homeland and, and we cannot. And that is a, a continuous threat. And that is a continuous source of anxiety for me. Um, that alone <laughs> says a lot, you know, so, um, so just consider what it means to constantly feel like you might not be able to go home and what Palestinian refugees who have been living in refugee camps all over the world um, experience every day. Um, so 
I guess my question, um, the next question is from Sut Jali. Um, and he's saying, when most Americans think of Hamas, they think of terrorist, militant, etc. How do you think we should think about Hamas as a serious political actor? Most people on the left center would agree, sorry, I lost it, would agree with much of 2017 charter, which is a national liberation document, but they simply don't know about it. How is Hamas different from how the ANC was acting under South African apartheid? Right, um, thank you for that question. Um, I think we also have to remember something important that when the mainstream media kind of proscribed the situation as a war between Israel and Hamas, that's also misleading. There are other groups that have participated in this. And one of them is a group that what my father was involved in as a young activist and a young fighter in Gaza back in the, in the 60s and 70s, and that's the socialists. My father is a socialist and I was raised on socialist ideals and so forth. And that is the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And the founder for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which is coordinating with Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, and other groups in Gaza, they have been coordinating for years and years, was actually established, established by a Christian man by the name of George Habash. Um, so this idea that this is about Hamas, it's not about Hamas. Israel uh, and Israeli, the, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine began in 1947-48. Hamas was established in 1987. How do we count for those 40 years? Why, why, was, why was there a conflict if, if Hamas did not start uh, until 1987, and if Hamas was indeed the start of that conflict? That's one point. And the other one, well, let's imagine this scenario. Hamas vanishes. All of their fighters, their leadership, we don't know what happens. They go underground in their tunnels, and they never reappear again. Is it over? Are we free as a people? Will the Israeli apartheid be dismantled? And we see the tank, Israeli tanks and, and soldiers retreating back to, to uh, Israel. And the walls will come down. The settlements will be removed. And Jerusalem will be given back. East Jerusalem will be given back to the Palestinian people. And the Gaza siege will be over too. And everything is going to be OK. And Ramsey can finally go and see, visit his father's grave. We know that this is not real. And we know it will not happen. We know that the issue is not Hamas. Hamas is a pretense. The pretense works now wonderfully because of the American war on terror and all of this. Netanyahu was very clever when he merged both Israeli narratives with the American you know, global war on terror narrative. But prior to this global war on terror, when the problem became Islamic fundamentalism and Islamic extremism and Islamic terrorism, there was other narratives. There was a time in which the fighters of Palestine were all socialists and communists. What was the, the, the narrative then? It wasn't Hamas. It wasn't, there is a problem with Islam that has to be fixed. It wasn't about any of this. It was about these communist Palestinians who are in alliance and getting training from the Soviet Union. It was always about something else. And when Hamas is gone and they are replaced by some other group, whatever that group is, there will be another Israeli narrative that is going to explain and justify and use them as a pretense. But the problem is not that. The problem is Palestinians will continue to fight. Just that's the nature of, that's a human nature. If someone, if someone affects you by force out of your home and claim it as their own, when someone takes over your land and claim it as its own, and when you try to protest, someone shoots at you, someone kills you, someone rapes your sister, someone places your people in South Africa like Bantu stands and lock you with a key, well, you're going to fight back, be it uh, using socialist ideas, Maoist ideas, Islamist ideas, secular ideas. You have to fight back. It's human nature. So please, let's not kind of really buy into this delusion that the problem is about Hamas. Hamas is just a manifestation of Palestinian history. It, it, it will at one point evolve into something else or get dismantled by circumstances out of Israel's con control entirely. But the problem will truly end with the Israeli occupation end. And we can actually start having a, a, a civilized conversation about coexistence and about finding a way 
in which we can put the past behind us. Until that occupation is there, there will always be resistance. The kind that we like and the kind that we don't like very much. But that's the true nature of this so-called conflict. And it's gonna continue as long as the occupation is still there. Um, Dr. Barud, I just wanted to shift gears just a little bit and ask you about your opinion regarding the normalization of relations with Israel that happened last year, you know, with the UAE, Sudan, Morocco, and um, uh, what's the fourth uh, country that I'm completely blanking on? Bahrain. Uh, Bahrain, yes. Um, so uh, could you talk about how Palestinians have felt about that? What that did? Did it give these countries any more leverage that they had at least said that, that this would give them vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Israeli government. Um, could you talk about that, please? Right. I think, I think one of the stories that is yet to be covered in the media, and it might take us a little bit of time to, to articulate that story, is how did the normalization, the so-called deal of the century of Donald Trump, the feeling, collective feeling of betrayal felt by ordinary Palestinian really exasperated the situation. And I think in many ways contributed to the revolt that we have seen in recent weeks. I think it's really played at a psychological level. I think it played a very, very central role in all of this. Throughout history, there have been attempts prior to Trump's deal of the century that basically um, try to figure a solution out to this conflict without the Palestinians being involved in it. Uh, an example would have been the Camp David agreement between Egypt, Anwar Sadat, and Menachem Begin's Israeli prime minister in the late 1970s. The Camp David agreement was signed without the Palestinians being involved. And even though the cause of Palestine has always been central to that entire region, Camp David has decided that we can basically jump over Palestinians all together and achieve peace without the Palestinians being involved. And not just that, a few years later in 1982, to ensure that the Palestinians have no recourse whatsoever and they cannot challenge Camp David, Israel invades Lebanon, killing tens of thousands of Palestinians and Lebanese and devastating the vast majority of South Lebanon and, and carry on with uh, some form of occupation until 2006. The, the, the deal of the century was another attempt, another one of those kind of American-centric attempts at um, imagining a solution that once more jumps over the Palestinians altogether, because they are not cooperating. How does the US and Israel want the Palestinians to cooperate? They want them to sign off on anything that Israel has in store for them. They want them to have minimal, if no rights at, at all. This is what Benjamin Netanyahu at one point called the, um, um, the not the political peace, uh, the economic peace, the economic peace. In his mind, you know, if you give Palestinians a little bit of money, secure a few jobs, they will forget about their political rights. They will not be demanding equality and rights and all of that. And really it was Netanyahu's economic peace that kind of passed on to Jared Kushner, very close family friends, sold to Mohammed ibn Salman in Saudi Arabia and Mohammed ibn Zayed in the United Arab Emirates, where they were told, listen, let's just jump over the Palestinians altogether and let's achieve this economic integration. Let's normalize Israel and the region without the Israelis paying any price. And what you get in exchange, you get a new strong ally in the face of the menacing Iranian threat. That was the deal. And the Palestinians were so irrelevant in this equation, so unimportant in this equation, to the point that other countries, aside from the four countries you just counted, other countries start flirting with the idea. Morocco, Mauritania, even Pakistan. I have been on so many Pakistani platforms, webinars, government conversations, uh, media, and so forth, trying to make a case to the uh, Amran Khan, the prime minister of Pakistan, please do not normalize with Israel. Because if you do normalize the Israeli occupation, then Israel has no incentive to end its occupation. So you can't norm normalize with Israel. But you know what? After what has happened in Palestine, after this popular revolt that invo involved every sector of Palestinian society, 
after the Palestinian people, despite of their pain and their wounds and their hurt and the destruction, they collectively roared from Ramallah to Gaza to Jerusalem to Umm al-Fahim and elsewhere. I was on another Pakistani webinar just actually yesterday. And I made, um, I made a, a statement on that webinar that was attended by a senator from the Pakistani parliament. And I said, can we please end this so-called debate in Pakistan about norm normalization? And he said, sir, it has ended. The Palestinian people have ended it. The whole idea of normalization with Israel is now buried deep. In fact, buried deep under the wreckage and the rubble of Gaza's destruction. Now, that leaves the countries that have normalized in a very, very tough position. Because in one hand, they made a commitment and some of them cashed handsomely like Sudan as a result of this commitment. And on the other hand, they find themselves isolated as the Arab street and Arab society is once more unified behind Palestine and the centrality of the Palestinian struggle. I really do insist that normalization, that, that feeling of betrayal that Palestinians have felt as a result of normalization had a very important role to play in this growing political consciousness among the young Palestinian generation in the West Bank and Gaza and elsewhere. Uh, thank you, Joshua Barut. We do have a question about humanitarian aid. Um, to Palestine, and as Sharon Moulton has asked, uh, you know, people have been asking about where to send aid and what would be good groups to support. Absolutely. Luckily, there are many organizations that provide uh, uh, aid to Gaza, and and I I particularly support organizations that um, and advocate for organizations that provide the kind of aid that doesn't just feed the hungry, but do more than that especially when it comes to medical aid. For example, in the US, I think we have the, the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. They have treated and saved the lives, outright saved the life of thousands of Palestinian children throughout the years. Many of them who have lost limbs and have been badly wounded and injured in Israeli previous Israeli war. And now you can imagine you have nearly 2,000 new injured uh, Gazans uh, 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 you know, as a result of this latest war. Um, so I would definitely recommend the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Also, uh, Kinder USA, kinderusa.org is their website. They provide the kind of support and help that goes directly to uh, Palestinian women to help them start small businesses uh, so that in order for them to sustain their families, but to also help their communities as well. And there is really nothing more, um, more uplifting than helping someone in need, but someone with a great deal of dignity and does not want to ask for help and does not accept charity. So you empower them, you help them create these kind of projects that, that can make a long-term difference uh, in their lives. There are other organizations as well in, in, in the UK and elsewhere, but these are the two top organizations that I can think of in the US at the moment. Thank you so much uh, for that. If we have um, uh, other questions, uh, we're sort of nearing the end of the program. So if you have any other questions, I think we might be able to take one or two. Um, and until we do, I'm wondering, Dr. Barut, if you could just perhaps say something about the Biden administration and uh, what your expectations are, what your hopes are um, with them. Uh, I know there's not a lot of optimism surrounding uh, the change in administration, but I mean, at this point, um, from outside of Israel and Palestine, where do you see the most hope in terms of who might be able to impact and influence events on the ground? I have very little expectations from Joe Biden, the politician, uh, but I, st I still feel that, that the Biden administration, if, if changes continue to happen within the Democratic Party, could find itself in a position where, and I'm being extremely cautious with, with, with my language as I, I, I don't want to sell false hope, but I feel that perhaps we are at the cusp of a change, a major change in the sense that 
a conversation regarding conditioning Israeli-American support to Israel is fairly new. There has been other attempts in the past, but any voice that has raised the idea of conditioning aid to Israel has immediately been shut out of the conversation. But there has been a conversation about it, and that conversation has been quite sustainable within the democratic uh, establishment. And I think if we continue to push in that direction, we could in fact find ourselves at a point where the, you know, Bernie Sanders and, and others who are demanding actual tangible accountability could eventually prevail. I don't know how long it will take, but it could potentially happen. That said, let's remember this. Um, at the end of the apartheid, uh, uh, the apartheid years and months in South Africa, the US, uh, Great Britain, and Israel were the last three countries, uh, three governments in the world that continued to support apartheid and continued to describe the likes of Nelson Mandela as a terrorist. Um, a fun fact, uh, even though Nelson Mandela was released in the early 90s and became president of his country shortly after, he remained on the US Congress list of terrorists and terrorism list until 2008. So the US political establishment is usually quite belated and quite very, you know, uh, they always drag their feet when it comes to actually taking moral stances. So we can't really expect them to be leading the way towards anything. Um, the hope comes from other countries because now Israel, as Israelis understand that well, and Netanyahu himself understand that well, is that there is a war of delegitimization. Now they don't phrase it that way. Netanyahu says delegitimizing the Jewish state. Nobody is trying to delegitimize the, the Jewish state. It's a delegitimization of Israeli apartheid and Israeli racism and the Israeli occupation. And that delegitimization is ultimately an intellectual and a legal and a political war. And that war cannot be won in Washington, DC. It has to be won at the United Nations. It has to be won at the International Criminal Court and the International Court of Justice, UNESCO, international organizations, regional organizations, uh, and, and even at, at city council levels and so forth and so on. And this is really where the real war is happening. And this is why Netanyahu in recent years, and he has bragged about this a lot, that this is why he has went back to Africa and offering African countries all sorts of Israeli aids and know-how and security and technology in order for them to convince them to not vote against Israel at the United Nations because Israel, yes, indeed managed to successfully occupy all of Palestine, but they have failed to legitimize Israel, to make Israel look and sound like a normal state. And despite of everything they have done in the past, not only they have failed, you have human rights organizations as of a month ago, like the uh, 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 Human Rights Watch coming and again with a decisive and conclusive conclusion that Israel is an apartheid state. So Israel is finding it very, very difficult to sustain that the, the, its reputation while the international community continues to speak out in, in solidarity with the Palestinian people. And that's really where, um, as Palestinians, we have been trying to focus as of late. Personally, I have been to South Africa. I have been to Kenya just, um, just before the whole COVID pandemic speaking with civil society organizations, with politicians, with people in the media, with student groups and so forth and so on. Other Palestinians have done the same in Africa, in South America, in Asia, in India, uh, and another specific example where we are actually trying to ensure that Israel does not win these countries with ha with, which have served as a strategic popular depth for the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause. And by watching the mass protest that has happened throughout the world in recent weeks, I can tell you that this is really quite reassuring, that indeed the world is once more unified around the Palestinian people and justice for the Palestinian people.
Thank you, Dr. Baroud. Um, I'd also just like to uh, draw everybody's attention to HR 2590, which is currently um, uh, under consideration in the US Congress. And that is, um, I think it was sponsored by a representative, Betty McCullum. Um, and this is a, a bill to promote and protect the human rights of Palestinians living under Israeli military occupation and to ensure that US taxpayer funds are not used by the government of Israel to support the military detention of Palestinian children the unlawful seizure, appropriation, and destruction of Palestinian property and forcible transfer of civilians in the West Bank or further annexation of Palestinian land in violation of international law. So um, I don't see any other questions uh, at this point. Um, uh, some of them were similar, or maybe there is just Oh, okay. So I'm going to uh, ask this last question with Dr. Landau. He's um, said, uh, he's asked, does Dr. Baruth accept the principle of self-determination of both peoples in a negotiated, inclusively just, mutually acceptable framework? I think that's a good question to end with, and then um, we'll sort of wrap it up. Absolutely. I fully support um, the uh, coexistence in one piece of land. Palestine, Israel, where Palestinians uh, and Israelis, uh, Jews and Christians and Muslims live side by side in a situation, and I know it's not going to resolve all the issues and address all the problems, but it's definitely the right step in the right direction. I know, and I've been to South Africa uh, several times uh, in the last 10 years, and I know that there are still all sorts of issues, economic inequalities, uh, um, and, and all sorts of structural problems uh, within South African society. But there is no doubt that ending apartheid, uh, breaking down the whole Bantu stand systems, the township systems, and allowing people, at least from a political and a legal point of view, to be treated as equals, uh, was in fact the right call and the right decision to make this generation and coming generations in South Africa are now responsible of translating the political and legal gains to true economic, socioeconomic equality. I think the same thing is as true in Palestine as is true anywhere else. The Palestinian people are the ones who are needing self-determination at this point because they are the native and the indigenous people of the land. Netanyahu comes from Poland. He doesn't come from Palestine. Yet somehow the, Israel, the nation state bill in Israel, I think it was 2008, gives the self-determination right to all Jewish people anywhere in the world and deny the Palestinian people any right to self-determination if at all actually acknowledge their existence. So if we are going to correct this equation, we have to respect international law, humanitarian law and common sense and grant Palestinians their right to self-determination self in their ancestral homeland. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Baroud. Um, we are sort of nearing the end of our program and I just want to say um, that we are full of gratitude to you for your incredible insights, your wisdom, your um, impassioned uh, case for the Palestinian people. And thank you for telling us ways in which we can support their efforts. And um, uh, and we just, you know, you gave us so much to think about and um, so much inspiration as well for you from your very, very powerful words. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who was able to join us today. Um, I'd also like to let you know that next week, next Thursday, um, at Critical Connections, we are hosting Peter Beinart. Um, and uh, the conversation then is going to be called Palestinian Rights, um, Jewish Responsibility, a conversation with Peter Beinart. So um, if anybody would like to attend that, please go to our website, criticalconnections.org, and there'll be a place for you to sign up. Once again, Dr. Baroud, thank you so much. Um, in solidarity. And I'm now just going to give the last word to my friend Aline, um, also Palestinian, um, to just sort of end the night. Thank you so much, Mahlika. And I, I realize we're coming so close to the end of the two hours. This was so inspiring, Dr. Baroud. I've heard you speak before, but it's really an honor to be in conversation with you. So thank you for joining us today. And thank you everyone for, um, for also being here with us. Um, so I, 
I mean, I want to actually just sort of end where you began, Dr. Berwood, around apartheid and how important it is for us really to work towards ending apartheid. And, at the, and Palestinians have been saying this for a very long time. Uh, we've actually been telling people we live under apartheid. It's a, it's a word that we've been using for years. Um, and it's finally, you know, an Israeli human rights organization and Human Rights Watch have also uh, declared that, that this is apartheid. I think my main point here is that listen to Palestinians, listen to our stories, um, and we are here to reclaim our narrative. We're the ones who speak for ourselves. Uh, no one should speak on our behalf. And we support, we're, we're very happy with our allies, but we, we can tell our own story. Um, so, you know, just think about that. And then at a time where racial injustice is completely unacceptable, and it should have always been unacceptable, but especially in the US over the past year, um, the, the racial reckoning, right? And it's still not enough, but it is a step forward. We also have to not accept Jewish supremacy, right? Uh, because that is what the Israeli state right now is based on. It's based on the fact that, or it's based on this illusion that, that, that Jew, uh, Jews are a superior race to, to you know, Palestinians. And that is not okay. And no one should accept that. I wouldn't accept that either of my people to think of themselves being superior to, to another people. When we talk about intersectionality, we really mean it. Um, we have been, uh, Black Lives Matter for us, uh, we've had a history with Black Americans and thanks to them, to be honest with you, that our narrative, the narrative has shifted a little bit. Um, and, and this is why it's so important for all of us to work together and to support each other and to be in solidarity. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, that was my, my, my last word. And then just one more thing around humanitarian aid. Uh, it's really important. I, I think it's also very important to support Palestinian organizations that are working to end this injustice. Uh, in the US specifically, there are, you know, a handful of organizations that are always punching above their weight. Uh, those include US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, Adala Justice Project, Palestine Legal, um, uh, Visualizing Palestine, which is uh, an, or an organization that's working beyond borders, and also Al Shabaka, uh, where I'm a board member. Uh, I have to, to say a word about them as well. This is important because we are um, amplifying Palestinian voices. We are reclaiming the narrative. Um, and yeah, thank you all for your support and uh, for being here with us tonight.